So the title of our IC is uh, Game Plan to Suc Success, that is Cataract GPS. So although cataract is one of the most commonly performed uh, surgeries, every day there are new challenges. So I'm sure most of you are uh, already practicing surgeons. Uh, you would have faced many challenges. So today we have a, a panel of speakers with a diverse uh, range of experience. Uh, there is Dr. Mansa who will be starting the session with the pearls on preoperative counseling. Then uh, I'll be speaking on uh, strategies in cataract surgery. Then uh, Dr. Merin will be speaking in, on intraoperative uh, uh, complication, uh, in, intraoperative complications in cataract surgery, tips and tricks. And uh, we have our mentor, Dr. Jay Prasad sir, who will be sp uh, speaking on uh, post-operative outcomes, how the fine art of managing them. And uh, we are also happy to say that uh, we have uh, Dr. Savio Pereira with us. He's our keynote speaker. He'll be speaking on uh, cataract surgery as a refractive surgery, back to basics. That's his topic. So let's start with the first uh, topic. Uh, I also uh, invite our uh, moderator, Dr. Siju, to take over. Thank you, Dr. Ambika. Yeah, so uh, the first topic is uh, pearls in pre-op counseling. Uh, and it is presented by uh, Dr. Mansa Srikumar. Dr. Mansa did her MBBS from uh, TD Medical College, Alipura, uh, MD from Ames, Delhi, and then fellowship in anterior segment and IOL from Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai. Currently, she's working at Trivandrum in uh, Gitanjali Eye and ENT Hospital, as well as in PRS Hospital. Of known respected faculty and delegates, uh, let me thank you all for coming and a warm welcome. Um, so thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. So as you can see on the screen, today my topic is pre-operative counseling in cataract surgery. So uh, my uh, presentation, I have divided into three parts. So in the first part, we will discuss how important patient education is, and in the second part, we will discuss how to validate it in a document and abiding by the existing laws by taking a valid consent, and finally, how to upgrade ourselves to meet the newer challenges. So fear of the unknown is the biggest fear of all. So a good, uh, an educated patient, he can make informed health decisions, and we can lower uh, surprises and ease him with the anxiety. So hence the importance of patient education, and we should tailor it according to the patient. So we, doesn't have, we don't have a one-size-fits-all concept. So now, we, we have to build a trusting relationship with our patients, and this is especially important when the patient is demanding, like emotionally active, with, un, like with unrealistic expectations. So we can follow these pearls. So first is partnership. That is, we talk in a way so that they feel like we are a team, like I need us to work on this together. Then second and the most important is empathy. That is, we, uh, we, can, we can make them understand that we understand their situation, that is, feeling with the person. So having empathy is not necessarily the same as endorsing their belief. So the patient might not be able to join us on a cognitive level, but we can find, they, they'll be able to find common grounds with us elsewhere. Now, acknowledgement and apology. So it's important that we acknowledge if the patient is dissatisfied with a particular treatment outcome and apologize if we are running behind schedule or we are late for some reason. It's okay. Respect their decision. Like, respect their decision even if not, it is not like accepting our advice. Now, legitimate their emotions and give adequate support when necessary. So you can ask your counselor to do this, like take the patient, uh, patient step by step through all this process so that it makes it easy for him to understand and go through this. And I'm not elaborating on them. And do we really spend enough time in our clinical practice for patient education? If not, there are reasons more than one for us to do so. Rising litigations and false information all around and moral reasons, like it is, we are respecting the patient's autonomy to make a decision. And, made, and ethical reasons, and this is especially important in patients who have, like, uh, who are likely to have poor visual outcomes, and in those patients who have demanding visual requirements, be it in their career or in their hobby. So, 
So the Ethics and Medical Regulation Board of the National Medical Commission in the draft regulation 2022 has stressed on the importance of consent. So any procedure requires a consent and no procedure can be trivialized, like not even a yak capsulotomy can be done without a consent. And any violation in this level is treated as level four, that is a suspension of license to practice from three months to three years. So uh, this is not a procedural formality, this is a legal requirement. And there are some essential principles that is to be followed while taking a consent. So one, it is to be taken before the procedure and any consent taken during the course of the surgery or the procedure is unacceptable. And it is, it is to be taken from the patient himself and witness consents are legally more dependable. And it should be informed, like the patient's diagnosis must be there along with the comorbidities, like the systemic diagnosis should also be there. And we should explain about the treatment offered, the benefits of the treatment, the adverse effects of the treatment, the consequence if he refuses the treatment, any available alternative treatment, and the approximate cost of the surgery. And we should also know that the patient has the right to refuse to give consent and also the right to withdraw consent at any point of time. And the uh, consent doesn't cover the anesthesia part. We have to take a separate consent for that. And if you're planning for a repeat procedure or any extension of the procedure, that is also to be taken in the consent. So any repeat procedure, we should close the case, take a consent, only then go for it if it is not mentioned in the consent. So now about the valid format, there is no published valid format as such, but generally we include the patient details, the witness details, the uh, disease details, and few points are that it should be taken in the patient's vernacular language, and normally we take a pre-printed fixed consent form, but that is not preferred. It is preferable if the patient, if we can ask the patient to write down the consent and sign it. And about the timing of consent, again, there is no consensus on the exact timing, but it is preferable not to take on the day of surgery because it will be considered like we are forcing it upon the patient. So common fallacies, one of the most common one is trivialization of the procedure and overlooking the importance of consent. And any alterations made, like if you strike off something in the consent, it has to be authorized by the patient's signature. And this is just a few examples. Just focus on the highlighted part where the National Consumer Disputes Redressal Commission has noted that a pre-printed fixed informed consent to be of an unfair trade practice and how suppression of vital information or providing half information is also considered to be violation of law. So the newer challenges, so the consumerization of healthcare and increasing digitalization is something we cannot deny. And varied health literacy levels. That is like in, uh, patients now prefer information in their language, in their level of understanding. And the growing case complexity, like post-pandemic, there is a delay in much needed care. So most of the cases that come to us are more complicated. And greater post-discharge accountability, that is even when the patient is walking out of the clinic, we are still accountable for them. But we have newer age solutions, like wider digital front doors. Like previously, there was a time when patients used to search for generalized information on platforms like Google and uh, YouTube, but now they prefer specific tailored information trust, from their trust, trusted treating doctor right to their uh, device of choice. So some might be preferring it in their iPad, some want it in their phone, so they need that multimedia experience now. And the work that doesn't, is not measured cannot be enhanced. So that is the importance of data analytics. So when we digitalize something, we, we can get better data. Like, uh, what is that the patient searches more? What, what is it that they, they like, they dislike? And based on that, we can upgrade our patient education strategies. And there are many healthcare practices worldwide which provide patient education videos to them right at the point where they take an online consultation. That is even before they walk into a clinic. And finally, a word about video consent. This can surpass many of the, down, the flaws of the informed written consent. So, but the disadvantage is that there might be cultural barriers. They might not be willing to come in front of the camera and uh, uh, like, uh, reveal about their illnesses. But the advantage is that the body language is very clear, so it doesn't look like we forced it upon them. Uh, so like, actually, in organ transplantation surgeries, video consent is a must. So this is like the new thing. 
So basically the take home pointers are follow the pearls to build relationship with your patients. Do not overlook the importance of a valid consent and upgrading ourselves to be future ready. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mansa. Uh, especially in this era of uh, litigations, and especially when many of our centers are getting accredited by NABH and JCI, these, these points are very important. Yeah, so thank you. Next, uh, we have our chair, chairperson, Dr. Ambika Shetty. She'll be talking about strategies for cataract surgery. Dr. Ambika com completed her MBBS from Sri, Sri Devaraj URS Medical College, Kolar, MS from Minto of Thadmik Hospital, Bangalore, and a long-term fellowship in phaco and refractive surgery from ne Nethru Dharma Eye Hospital, Bangalore. She established the eye department, retina clinic, and operative, op operation theater at uh, Gitanjali Eye and ENT Hospital, Trivandrum. Over to you, Dr. Ambika. Yeah, in the meantime, uh, uh, would the audience like to ans ask any questions to Dr. Manasa? So, if you look at 10 years back, 15 years back, uh, there was always the surgeon taking responsibility for any of the complications that is happening. But these days, from that uh, frame of mind, I have changed a situation where I tell the patient every other complication. I'll tell you the example of a judge who came for surgery. He was a cardiac, of course. And uh, he was from the consumer court judge, actually. He came for cataract surgery, and then suddenly, he, at the end of the consultation, uh, surgery planned, decided. As he was going out, he asked, where are the doctor? Where are the problems? In the table, Munal Ashwatri Kedraya KC Ripunda. So then you are. <coughs> Antony is. Okay. Then I called him back. I made him sit. And then I said, Death is the biggest complication that can happen, even though we are operating under uh, topical anesthesia. Uh, what can happen on the road or in the street or in your house can happen here also. And that is, uh, that you have to keep in mind. And then I told him about all the possible complications. You have to take uh, the, um, this responsibility that in case you have a problem, you have to bear with it. The, whether you are the patient or my mother is a patient, it is the same. So I think in today's world, we should tell them everything. We may not use the lens that you are asking for. We may use the lens that is best for you in your given situation at that point of time. So these are the few things I want to say. Ambika, please carry on. Thank you, sir. A warm good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Today I'll be discussing a few uh, case scenarios in which uh, strategy has helped us to achieve favorable outcomes. So the first case is that of a 65-year-old lady. She, he, she presented to the OP with a sudden onset of pain, uh, watering, and loss, profound loss of vision in her left eye. Her intraocular pressure was noted to be 60 millimeters. She had an edematous cornea, very shallow anterior chamber with an iridocorneal touch, and a fixed pupil. So the diagnosis was quite evident. It was a sudden onset, and it was an acute angle closure attack. The patient was ma uh, ma uh, managed medically, and uh, after two days, the intraocular pressure reduced. So after her intraocular pressure reduced and her cornea became relatively clear, we noticed that the patient had a significant cataract in that eye. The unaffected eye had a normal gonioscopy, and uh, the, uh, when we did the biometry, we understood that the affected eye had a lens thickness of, of about 4.6 millimeters. The other eye was only 2.4 millimeters. So obviously, the lens was contributing to the angle closure attack. After discussing the risks and benefits, the patient was advised to undergo a cataract surgery. So the patient was willing to undergo the surgery. So side ports were made very carefully because the anterior chamber is shallow. 
Since the pupil was non-dilating, it was only about three millimeters. Even with midriatics, I had to use iris hooks. So after the iris hooks were placed, while making the capsular excess, I realized that the um, zonules were slightly weak. So minimal hydro dissection was done. And even during the nucleus emulsification, uh, I was careful not to do the, uh, not to rotate the uh, fragments and uh, I was very careful. So the rest of the surgery was uneventful. So during the cortex aspiration, there was a slight iris prolapse from the phaco wound. This was reposited back. The IOL was placed and the iris hooks were removed. The wound was sutured and the case was completed. So when the patient came for the first po uh, uh, in her first post-operative uh, visit, that was on day one, and the next visit was after one week. The patient was free of her symptoms. The intraocular pressure reduced to 13 millimeters mercury, and her visual acuity also improved to 6 by 12. So the strategy adopted in this was first thing is patient education. Since the patient had a sudden onset of uh, symptoms, she was not really prepared for, to undergo a surgery. So she was counseled why she needs surgery. The second was preoperative uh, control of the intraocular pressure. And intraoperatively, uh, particular devices like cohesive viscoelastic was used while making the capsular excess. And also iris hooks were used to dilate the pupil. So the next case is that of a 70-year-old. This patient has po had poor vision in both her eyes. She was almost uh, struggling for uh, two years during the pandemic situation. In her left eye, she had a, in her left eye, the patient had a hypermature cataract with phacodonesis. And in her right eye, she had a very dense brown cataract. The patient also had significant corneal scars because of an episode of smallpox in her childhood. So on biometry, we noticed that this patient had eight diopters of astigmatism in the IOL plane. So she was not suitable for a regular toric lens. So that's the reason we had to order a customized intraocular lens, toric lens for her. So the advantage of the customized lens is that it need not be rotated. It can just be placed at 0 and 180 degrees. Also, this patient was advised to undergo cataract surgery in her right eye as uh, uh, she was explained that the prognosis would be better. One thing, the vision is better, and also the left eye had significant phacodonesis, so that is why the patient was advised counsel, uh, she was advised cataract surgery in her right eye, which had the brown cataract. A temporal clear corneal incision was made, a capsular excess was done, after hydro dissection and during the phaco emulsification, I noticed that the cornea started becoming hazy. At this point of time, I realized it's not safe to continue and converted to a superior scleral incision. So the nucleus was delivered through a phaco sandwich technique and the same intraocular lens was placed. Postoperatively, when the patient was examined on the second week, she had a visual acuity of 612, unaided. So this patient was quite happy with her visual outcome. So the strategy adopted in this patient was, suiting, was choosing the uh, correct intraocular lens. And intraoperatively, when encountered with a challenging situation, uh, shifted to something that was more comfortable and that would be more safer for the patient in the particular uh, scenario. The next case is that of an intumescent cataract. In intumescent cataracts, because of shallow anterior chamber and increased intralenticular pressure, it's always a challenge to do the capsular excess. So that is the most challenging step in a case with intumescent cataract. So here I've used the double rexis technique. First, a cohesive viscoelastic is injected into the anterior chamber. A puncture is made on the anterior capsule. And the capsular excess is made in very small steps by frequent regrasping. A small capsular excess, about 3 millimeter in size, is completed. 
And this capsular, uh, once the capsular bag is decompressed, this capsular excess is extended, is enlarged by using micro scissors and micro forceps. So it's always better to use the side ports to uh, manipulate the, uh, it is better to use the side port so that the anterior chamber depth is maintained. The rest of the cataract surgery was uneventful. So the strategy adopted in a intumescent cataract is that of using a cohesive viscoelastic maintaining the anterior chamber depth throughout the surgery and using a two-stage capsular excess. The next case is that of a small pupil. This patient was on alpha antagonist drugs and the pupillary dilatation, the maximum pupillary dilatation was around four millimeters. So this patient is actually an ideal case for a uh, pupil expansion ring. So in this case, I've used the B-hex ring BHEX is a flexible device. It is made of polyimide and it is an innovation by an Indian doctor from Calcutta, Dr. Suven Bhattacharji. So the advantage of this BHEX is we need not make additional uh, entries into the cornea. It can be inserted and removed through the uh, clear corneal incision itself. It's quite easy to learn this technique. The only thing extra that we need to invest on is our micro forceps. So microforceps is used to grasp the flanges and alternate flanges are tucked in behind the iris. Once all the flanges are in place, the rest of the cataract surgery can go on as a, like a regular case. There's one step which we need to be careful, that is while injecting the intraocular lens. There's a possibility that sometimes the trailing haptic gets engaged in the ring. So it's always important to be careful while injecting the trailing haptic and ensure that it doesn't get uh, engaged in the ring. So post-operatively, you can see that the pupil has maintained a fairly good contour. So the strategy adopted is to assess preoperatively what is the maximum pupillary dilatation using the appropriate device in a particular situation and also understanding what is your skill set and using that skill set uh, to the best possible outcome. So to summarize, I would say that it is important to do a detailed workup, educate the patient about the risks and benefits, do a combined decision making with the patient, prepare an OT list, keeping in uh, mind vulnerable patients and also uh, challenging, uh, challenging, challenging Situations should be kept in mind and use appropriate intraocular devices. Intraocular lenses should be customized for patients and senior staff should be posted for challenging cases. And please ask the help of an aesthetist whenever needed. It will reduce the stress of the surgeon and also to be flexible in your approach. When you are presented with a chakra viewham, don't become like Abhimanyu who didn't know the exit strategy. Learn the proper strategy and become emerge victorious. Thank you. Thank you for the patient here. Thank you, Dr. Ambika. Thank you. Uh, so the key point from this, uh, as you all heard and understood is, have all your strategies ready. Be ready to change them whenever you require them. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, next we have uh, tips and tricks of managing interoperative surprises in, uh, and is, it is presented by Dr. Mary, uh, Marine Paul. Dr. Marion is a well-known cataract and phaco surgeon since uh, 1998. She is currently medical director of Trinity Eye Hospital, Thrissur. She did her MBBS and MS from MGIMS, Sevagram Vardha. Uh, she did her DNB a year later. She has got uh, the first phaco in Kerala from AIOS uh, in cataract and phaco surgery. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Ambika, for having me here. and. Uh, very, very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you all for being here. So when uh, Dr. Ambika told me that, um, you know, do a presentation and um, so she said, ma'am, will you talk on intraoperative surprises? And that is what I prepared. And um, I think it has worked out well because uh, I feel that there is a difference. Okay, I'm not visible here, right? Okay. Uh, I feel that there is a definite but subtle difference between what are surprises that ha happen 
and complications like what Ambika showed us just now, which you are anticipating preoperatively. When something is there preoperatively, you know that, you know, in your mind that you know, like, okay, these are the stuff that can go wrong. These are the complications which are likely to happen. And you prepare for them mentally and with the hardware that you have in your theater. Now, another thing that I'm going to specify here is that this is, my talk would not be for people who have, you know, access to everything at all the times. So we know that, like, you know, when most of the talks are done from main, major institutions, major hospitals where you have the best equipment and you have the best, you know, supporting uh, equipment as well. But many of us uh, in smaller institutes, in smaller uh, hospitals, especially single uh, owner owned hospitals, do struggle at times with uh, things, you know, are, which, which are not often, you know, used and so you may not have it in time. So that is something which I'm going to talk about. So like I said, so what are the common problems that you would face in a routinely in an intraoperative scenario? So we know that in there is a hypermature cataract, it is possible that there may be a Argentinian flag sign. So you are mentally prepared for it. But there are times when a regular looking, innocent looking cataract suddenly misbehaves and the rex starts going to the periphery. Happens, right? So that is a surprise. You need to have a strategy in mind to tackle that. Similarly, you see a patient with a, zonulo, uh, with a pseudo exfoliation or a previous history of uh, trauma or one of those syndromes like uh, Marfan's or you know any of those syndromes, you know in your mind, yes, there's a possibility there is a zonulopathy. Now the interesting thing about zonulopathy is that a gross subluxation or a dislocation can be easily diagnosed preoperatively. But zonular weakness is actually an intraoperative diagnosis. From the studies available now, it is shown that almost 95% of intraoperative zonular weakness, I'm not talking about subluxation, I'm not talking about zonular dialysis, but zonular weakness is an intraoperative diagnosis. And many, many times we see it only, we can only diagnose it on the table. Similarly, a patient who is on uh, prostate meds, you know there can be IFIS. You know that, but imagine a woman in her, say, 40s who is on some uh, antihypertensives, you have not paid attention to it, can still develop IFIS. Why? Because there are some antihypertensives like labetalol, etc., which, you know, because we don't keep in touch with a lot of what physicians are, you know, prescribing. They can develop IFIS, and it just comes as a, you know, a, a bolt from the blue. You're not expecting it. Intraoperative meiosis, again, senile meiosis patients and all, you are like prepared, yes, it can happen. But there are those cases where for no reason at all, the pupil goes down. I, and um, PCR, I think, is always a uh, surprise, except for, you know, probably a posterior polar cataract. Every time it is, it is a shock. Similarly, IOL damage can't be predicted. So uh, I will take you through a couple of cases. Uh, yeah. So before I start this video, let me give you a caveat there. This was a case which I did when I, uh, when uh, during the COVID times. So this was a small um, charitable hospital. There was a um, lot of supply chain issues, and there was a lo long list and. This seemed to be a very innocuous case, and we started off, it was the last case in the list, and we already had about three or four cases requiring iris hooks. And when we started off, oh, sorry. When we started off, everything looked pretty okay. And uh, I started with the, uh, you know, my, uh, you can see when I started the rexis, everything looks okay. There's slight meiosis, but nothing that is not manageable. After the hydrodissection, the pupil seems to come down a little bit. But when I'm doing the rotation, the pupil has come down further. And at that point, uh, yes. So when I went in with the phaco probe, the pupil literally 
like came down very, very, it became a very small um, pupil and then I stopped surgery and asked for iris hooks. And at that point they say, ma'am, um, they pretended to search and finally said that, ma'am, there are no more iris hooks left for the day. So what now? In such situations, your friend is the viscoelastic. So you repeatedly reform the chamber, stay right in the center, always master your chops. Because even if you do your hydro, dis, uh, you know, uh, divide and conquer, in these situations only chop will work. So stay right in the center, try not to touch the pupillary margins. There is iris prolapse. In those situations, push it back with cohesive viscoelastics so that the pup you get some space in the anterior chamber. Divide it into very, very tiny pieces, always with the chop, and then eat it up individually. So fr uh, frankly, with a lot of luck as well, I was able to complete that case or manage the nucleus without much trouble. And once the nuclear bits were out, the, the next step also is quite challenging because you can see the, you know, the extent of how much cortex is there. So it was practically done as a blind procedure using the second instrument to pull back the, the pupillary margins, remove the cortex, and finally injected the IOL. Once the IOL is in place, we have to retract the iris in 360 degrees to make sure that there is no, um, one second, that there is no, because you have divided the nucleus into very small pieces. Those small pieces can hide very easily under the iris. So do make sure that there are no nuclear fragments. Cortex is more forgiving. If you leave behind even a small nuclear fragment, this will lead to intractable uveitis. You will have no idea why this uveitis is happening. You'll keep on, you know, wondering, wondering. So after about, you know, three, four episodes of uveitis, you'll find that one piece of nucleus fragment coming into the anterior chamber has happened. So these are things which you need to. So the tip here is that if you do not have, you know, access to either iris hook or a BHEX, in these situations, do keep yourself, keep your probe central, use uh, plenty of viscoelastics and always check the periphery at the end of the surgery to see that you have not left behind anything. So that was about that case. Our next case, yeah, this is that case just finishing up. Next case was a case of rexis. This was a case I just started the rexis and I realized that there's a lot of, you can see those folds on the anterior capsular surface. This is because there is zonular weakness. This was an absolutely uh, you know, I, not at all expected. And then I, you changed from the needle to the utrata forceps, again, pressurizing the chamber at all points. But always support the lens with a second instrument so that there you, are sub, you are giving sufficient counter-traction when you are doing the rexis. But every time you pull it, you will find that there are folds forming on the anterior capsular surface. Now, at, in spite of all this, the rexis has gone now to the periphery and here I've used the Littles procedure to pull the, that little last fragment uh, into, the anterior, uh, into the center and completed that. So tip here is that stabilize the um, capsule with a second instrument and if there is rexis runaway, use a second, uh, Littles procedure. And um, this was a case where everything looked okay, but after the nucleus management, the bag has crawled in on itself, and there is a zonular dehiscence. So repressurize the chamber with viscoelastic, and at these points, there is no other go but to use a CTR to stabilize the capsular bag, and then we can do the further this thing. Now, important thing in this is that because there is cortex left behind in these situations, you may have to do a tornado type of or a hurricane technique for removing the um, cortex and always make sure that the open part of the lens, once almost done, uh, of the ring is away, facing away from the area of dialysis. And the final video is that of 
uh, iris, uh, so, uh, haptic breaking. You can see that the entire haptic is in the um, cartridge. In this situation, there is no other go. I try, you know, if the, if the length of that haptic is slightly, you know, broken haptic is slightly longer and your rexis is smaller, you can attempt an optic capture, but not really recommended. But in this case, I just explanted it because there was no way this lens was going to center. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope that was useful. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so again, sticking back to that same thing, change your strategy when you uh, uh, encounter surprises. Thank you for all the tips, madam. Next, we have JP, sir. Dr. J. Pr uh, J. Prasad Baskaran will be talking on the art of managing post-operative complications. He is the founder chairman of Amardeep IK Host Centers, Trivandrum and uh, Kollam. He is also a visiting faculty at Cochin Eye Care Center, Alua. He pioneered facomal emulsification in Kerala, being the first keyhole cataract surgeon in Trivandrum. He did his MBBS from Trivandrum Medical College, MS from RIO Trivandrum, fellowship from Shankara Eye Care uh, Coimbatore. He was awarded FICO and in cataract and FICO in uh, 2015 and for glaucoma in 2020. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon. I'm very glad that all of you have, uh, are here, not sp uh, speaking to empty chairs. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, excellent talks from Ambika and all the other speakers here. And uh, let me start on managing post-operative complications. I'll just go through an overview, there, rather than going in detail about managing single cases, if you have an endophthalmitis, let me t this is from Google, the picture. Um, always remember, you are alone and you have an endophthalmitis. Talk to the patient, the seriousness of the issue. Take a vitreous sample, give Vanco Kefta, then refer to a VR surgeon. That will be in the best interest of the patient as well as uh, avoiding a medical legal issue. And then you come back and investigate as to is there a source in your uh, theater from where this has happened. And always keep your cool. Because at that point, if you start getting agitated, nothing is going to happen. Be cool and um, be prepared to face. I had my last end of thalmitis in 2014, 2013. 13 cases I operated. I had one single case of end of thalmitis came on the fourth day. Uh, the only uh, point I can show, I mean, say um, against the patient is that they were keeping uh, uh, cotton, simple cotton, over the uh, operated dye, and the entire thing was soaked with multiple drops and all the sweat and other things. We do not know, but we uh, investigated, nothing was found. So always remember to give an injection, take a uh, vitreous sample, send for microbiology, then send refer to the pay, uh, to the VR surgeon. And to prevent, always remember, povidone iodine is excellent, proven povidone iodine. And when you drape, you always drape. You have your um, pointer, uh, sir. Sir? Hello? Pointer? Yeah. And uh, drape it well. And uh, from 2014, I have been using endowed smoxifloxacin. I have no financial interest. But that is, I never used, um, which one? The, this one? The red, red dot. Oh, no, that's not working yet. Yeah, so I always give moxifloxacin in all my cases. 0.3 ml of moxifloxacin and 0.7 ml of VSS I add. Make it 1 cc and then I use it to replace the, uh, the entire BSS inside the bag. I also use the same to hydrate all the side port as well as the main port at the end of surgery. The same one, I never had any endothelial problem. I never had any task. All these uh, I have been doing for nine years now. It is not just a small uh, aliquot of uh, moxifloxacin undiluted into the bag, no. And then, of course, TAS, of course, you know, it happens uh, in the first um, 24 hours. And please remember, hit it with steroids, topical as well as systemic, and don't give up till three months uh, because it will clear up. Most of the cases will clear up. This is once again from Google, it's not, but we do come across many such cases. I had one patient, I remember, my, an ophthalmologist's mother, 
Other eye I operated with mature cataract. It was absolutely fine. She was very happy. She said, OK, let us operate the second eye, immature cataract, 6 8 in vision. First post-operative day, it was counting fingers one meter. And severe task, actually. The ophthalmologist cried. I also cried along with her. But at the end of six months, that cornea cleared. She lived with a clear vision for about 17 years, and then she passed away. So. Whenever you see tasks, don't worry. But then you should go back and find out whether your OT staff are cleaning your cannulas and tubes well. There shouldn't be any residual chemicals. And do not change the brand of your BSS OVD or the Blu-Rex which you are using. If you are comfortable with one brand, continue using it. The other fellow will come and say that I'll give you 30% discount or I'll give you 100 free. Please don't fall for that. Use whichever you think is comfortable. You can change provided you have friend, multiple people have used hundreds or thousands and say that they, they are quite safe. Otherwise, do not change. And always wash away the talc on your um, gloves if you are using a powdered glove. The other one is thrice costly. Now, DM strip is something that can happen. Here, this is one DM strip. Once again, let me tell you, it is an ophthalmologist's father, actually. A pretty aged man, 90 years, very hard cataract. I did FACO, uh, went very well. But then at the end of uh, one week, uh, the patient came back with edema in one area. This was uh, handled by my uh, cornea surgeon, Dr. Anil Radhakrishnan. Um, a mixture, a 14% mixture of C3F8 with air injected from a non-affected area. Then this process called vending is done, where you poke the stroma and let out the fluid so that uh, the uh, decimates will adhere better. So always how to prevent. Please remember, the, uh, the wound sizes should be adequate. You should have carefully, you should insert and remove all instruments. When you are using your FACO tip to enter into the anterior chamber for the first time, Please press down on the posterior lip and then go in gently. And if you see a small strip at the limbus, don't say, oh, nothing will happen. It will heal well, no problem. Always put in a large air bubble and ask the patient to lie flat for 24 hours at home. Nothing will happen. It will stick. Steroid in this glaucoma is another one that has happened. Many a times the patient goes on buying it from the pharmacy for uh, months and months and years. And please remember that if it is more than 180 days of steroid drops, steroid induced glaucoma, then it becomes a chronic uh, open angle glaucoma. I'm sure uh, Smith and Kiran will agree with, with me on that. Please remember that. Please check the IOP when the patient comes. You can do only an NCT. And if in doubt, do a uh, get. So at seven, uh, day seven, at six weeks and three months, please check. And whenever you write a prescription of steroids, whether it is topical or systemic, write stop in big capital letters, stop. Nirtanam in Malayalam, you should always write. And uh, that will help you medically, legally, and also save the patient's eye. These days, I think about myself first before I think about the patients. And this, I used, I did use this anterior subtenance orocot. 10 milligram per ml, it's a diluted one. What you get commercially is 40 milligram per ml. I used it at the end of surgery to reduce the number of drops. I give this orocot, and then I give intracameral moxie, and then I give topical antibiotics only for 10 days, then no medications. There was only one breakthrough inflammation, but I had five cases of post-operative steroid-induced glaucoma, where one case, I excised that uh, uh, orocot, the others, I put them on anti glaucoma medications, they resolved. But then I stopped using it because I thought if the patient goes away, a patient doesn't come back for a follow up, patient has a stroke and is not coming to you at all, then there is always a higher risk. And this has not been sort of, uh, it's, it is not very attractive for me at this point of time. And then, of course, I have wrong eye oil power. Uh, you put OVD on both sides, always support with your left hand instrument. Always support with the left hand instrument. Cut gently, ensure that there is adequate OVD above and below. You can implant the lens and then cut also. That is another option. Um, and when you take it out, please remember to keep that left hand instrument pushing down on whatever is coming behind. So you put OVD there. You go in with your forceps, a lens holding forceps. Always, whatever people say, I extend the wound a bit to minimize trauma to the wound. And then you go with a lens holding forceps, hold, go with my dialer from the left side, keep pushing on the, that half of the IOL so that it comes out vertically. It doesn't touch the endothelium at all. 
the second half, hold it down, then bring it out. And then you can implant the lens into the back. This was a high myope plus, I, mean, I think it was 32 axial length. Please do multiple scans, multiple characterometries, multi multiple machines if you have, all immersion always. And optical, if you have available, it's extremely good. Uh, I think uh, uh, um, uh, Dr. Paul will always say that in silicon filled eyes and extremes of axial length, optical biometry is excellent. I also agree with that. And always remember to check both eyes. When you have delayed decentration of a lens, this is one patient who was, who was referred to me. So we get an optic capture. You suture it to the iris. The haptics are sutured with 9-0 proline to the iris. And then you do a Sapser knot. Put in a Sapser knot, which is, I think, a well-sanded well procedure. And once you tie it to the iris, it stays. You can do uh, the same on the opposite side. So once the, tie, uh, the haptics are tied to the iris, you push it back, gently nudge it down, and that is the end of the story. You, you have, this is one patient, unfortunately, another of uh, another of Salmology's um, mother, actually. Very hard cataract, one eye I had already operated. Delayed post-operative end of uh, The bag was clean, vitreous was clean. Steroids, steroids, tapering, once again, inflammation. So I did a gonioscopy on this patient. This is a uh, surgical gonioscope, actually, which is used for um, multiple uh, operative, intraoperative procedures. So. If you look into that angle, inferior angle, you will see that there's a small bit of um, nucleus lying there, somewhere here. I think you can see, yeah. You can see now that there's a small bit of nucleus lying there, inducing this recurrent inflammation. So I went in using a San Jacob lens that I use for my goniotomies, and then I take it out remote. The patient, I became very quiet. Yes, he had severe cystoid macular edema, which resolved. I think I'll stop it at this point. Time is over. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you, uh, JP, sir. Thank you for all that information. Sir, as uh, Notley told us about uh, uh, the managing the post-operative, he's also uh, told us how to prevent it from occurring to begin with. Yeah. So next is uh, Dr. Savio uh, Pereira. Pereira who will be presenting the keynote address with the topic cataract surgery as a refractive surgery, optimizing outcomes. Back to the basics. Dr. Savio did his MBBS from KEM Hospital, Mumbai, MS from INHS Ashwini, uh, which is in the Navy. So he's actually a Lieutenant Commander. Uh, yeah. But he did his uh, DNP and long-term FACO, refractive fellowship from Netra Dhamma, Super Specialty Eye Hospital, Bangalore, where he um, holds a position of senior consultant at present. Sir, yeah. Thank you for the very warm welcome. Uh, thank you, Kerala Ophthalmic Society, for having me here, Dr. Ambika, for inviting me. And when we are talking for cataract surgery as a refractive surgery, uh, we have to understand, at the end of the day, every person desires to be glasses-free. Now, this has been not now. It's been from ancient time. The Chinese used to keep sandbags on their eyes. So when you would sleep and get up in the morning, you would actually be, the myopia would be cured. Even Perkinji tried the same thing, the famous Perkinji images. And if you look back in time, right from the 1800s, there were a lot of these ads coming out where people would try to just, you know, another form of orthokeratology, where to try to have mallets, something pressing on the cornea, and give you some amount of glasses-free vision. Now, what is happening nowadays is you have patients who are post-LASIK, post-refractive surgery, post phakic eye wells, coming with cataract, and they want to be glasses-free again. And that expectation is something which is a huge, huge weight on the surgeon and on the entire system. So when you talk about biometry for such patients or any of your patients, be it immersion, be it contact, be it your optical, be it ST, OCT, the axial length is never a problem. In high myopes or hypermetropes, the axial lengths are pretty accurate in all of these. Whenever you get any study, and something is controversial, I just look at two things. The financial interest of the authors and the disclosures. And if it's of the same equipment, I just put that study aside. Because it's very easy to exclude all the wheat from the shaft. Now, the main problem is the keratometry. And that is the key in your biometry. 
And we have to thank Dr. Shimizu at all who invented the Toric IOL way back in 992, and he presented it in 994. But what happens when you're doing keratometry, be it the manual, be it the automated or topography, is that each of them work on very different principles. And most of them, since they have a camera in the center or a viewing system in the center, 3 to 3.2 mm of the center cornea is always missed. And that data is extrapolated. And that's the reason why your keratometry goes off in LASIK patients, in other patients, because that's the main part which is treated. So what do we do? Now, we went back ahead and we actually found out what if you don't have the high-end equipment, oh, I have this, I have that. Manual K for most of the regular cases post-LASIK give you pretty good accurate keratometric readings. And I'm not I'm saying it. There are studies which actually say it. So yes, you can use your toric lenses even in irregular astigmatism, but they have to be very specific indications. Always look for regular astigmatism. And as Dr. Ambika said that you have to be very careful and you can give the patient optimized, customized toric IOLs in very high powers which are not available. Now one of the few things I want to mention over here is if you have optical biometers, they measure it either in six zones, eight zones, and if the astigmatic axis is between these, be careful the data is again extrapolated. And that is where manual case goes over because you can rotate it and get the axis much more accurate. So if you have a Bosch and Law manual K rusting somewhere in your OPD, use it. It does help a lot. And whenever we do have any doubts, we go back to the manual K and just verify. It gives you a little bit better good night's sleep the next day. So regarding the point of whether you should use uh, higher lenses or lower lenses, especially since you get gradations of plus 0.5, a very simple rule I would say is always overcorrect the astigmatism in against the rule. So add for against the rule, the one other thing, just forget it. Just remember this one thing. Add, so if you're getting between powers, you're not sure which one to go for, go for a little higher power if it is against the rule. So remember plus add against the rule. That's how I remember it. It's exactly opposite for with the rule. Uh, regarding surgically induced astigmatism, there have been lots of studies, lots of papers. Everybody claims to have the lowest surgically induced astigmatism. And the real fact is if anything is less than 2.8, 2.2 incisions or 2.8 itself, you don't induce much astigmatism at all. But the real fact of matter is I would say a temporal incision is one of the best things to do. And if you're doing superior incisions, nothing against you, just switch over to temporal do a pre-op and post-op K, and you will see the amount of astigmatism you induce is much, much lesser. So try this out. Regarding calculators, and you don't need to have expensive biometry. Most of the biometries these days, they come up with licenses to use the online calculators, which is actually freely available. You just have to know which website to go to. So in patients who are post-LASIK, you have LVC, that is the laser vision correction mode. And you can actually put in all these data, what was the pre-op refraction, what was the topography, if it's available, and you will get the laser power correction, and you will have a much better biometry. Now, this is free of cost. Uh, now, regarding toric IOLs, there's a lot of uh, you and cry. You know, they had these markerless systems coming up, saying, oh, they had these smudged images of people having all blue eyes post-marking. Uh, marking, if then incorrectly, can have a plus or minus 10 degrees. So the very simple thing is just do a good slit lamp marking. The main problem with slit lamp marking is that have you do it yourself, take it up, up as the first case the moment you scrub inside. And the key is exactly bang across, bisect the pupil. Do it nicely, make a fine slit. If you're not sure about your marks so or you're using an old marker, Take a simple 26 gauge needle and indent the epithelium on either side. You do get marks which stay in at the end of surgery also. This is one of the tricks you can use. If you have a fresh marker, nothing like it. Now, I'm just coming to high myopia and high uh, hyperopia. Now, what happens in high myopia, you should understand, is that first of all, your axial length can be slightly off. Because of the posterior staphyloma, sometimes they can't fixate properly because they have macular scars. You can indent the cornea a bit, 
And most of the formulas, if your axial length is above 27, there's a fudge factor. It's not very accurate. The same thing happens with hyperopia. The ACD is effective, the ELP changes, you have a shallow anterior chamber, so be a little careful in these types. So I'll just give you a few things that this is, it's there everywhere, all this. We use Barrett Universal too. It's a safe formula. You get most of the things right. And at the same time, what happens is it's free of cost. So I'm just going to discuss a few cases over here. We had this young patient, 47-year-old. Patient is post-LASIK, post phakic post IOL, done 18 years back, and comes over here for a cataract surgery and says now what to do. I want you to just look at the IOL powers over here, and you can see that each, I will put each and every formula over here, right from the ray tracing formula right down up to Barrett Universal 2, and you can see the variation in formulas that are there. Now what we did was, one more thing I want to see is, you can see by just putting untreated and by putting LASIK in the LVC mode, you see the power changes from zero to plus two straight away. So this is something which I was telling you. If you go to the online and say post laser vision correction, the extrapolated data changes. And you can see here, 33.27, 33.28, the axial length is not your problem. It's the keratometry that gives you the problem. And that itself changes. The same lens is zero to plus two. On a word of advice, always, always in all your patients who are highly myopic, target minus two straight away. Even if you make a mistake, you are going to make the patient myopic, and he's always been myopic, he will thank you. Now, one of the things I usually do is check for dominance. And do the eye, which is for near first, the non-dominant eye, target a little bit more of myopia, that gives you how the lens is going to behave in the eye. And that will give you a better correction. So even if you got a minus 1.5, the patient is still happy. These are very high myopes. You can see the axial lengths. Now, another case of high myopia, this was a patient where the eye, patient was uh, you know, having a refraction of minus 28 and minus 24. This is huge. And was, uh, we couldn't put any, uh, uh, never went for a ICL because the ACL was very, very shallow. So we went ahead, and you can see the axial length. You can see everything is done. And it, the lens selected is minus 5.5 by the IOL master, but we went ahead and put minus three. And this is what I'm telling you. Your target refraction, always go ahead and keep it around minus two diopters more. Or you can just simply go ahead with your target refraction, and instead of keeping it zero over here, go ahead and keep it minus two. This is very easy, and it's putting simple monofocal lenses and trying to make your patient glasses free. We did it for the other eye also, and you can see it's showing minus three. We went ahead and put a minus one lens. Go more towards the plus. That is the key. Now, this is one of the shorter eyes which we did. This was actually a young patient, 19-year-old, who had plus 12, 12.25 uh, and 12.75 in the other eye. Now, when you're talking about refractive lens exchange, I'm almost done. This is my last slide. Uh, this was high. And you see the IOL power, plus 46, plus 47. These were patients, you can't treat them anyhow, be it ICL, be it LASIK, nothing. A patient had such thick glasses, we went ahead, did a refractive lens exchange, put in a simple uh, monofocal lens. You can see the variations from formulas, from SRKT to Barrett Universal 2, 42 diopters to 46 diopters. So be careful. Do with different formulas, and then you can go in for an average. Tell the patient you will have to still wear glasses. We put in plus 46, plus 47 in either eye. In the end, you can see that the patient developed 26 by 18, and the patient was amblyopic, amblyopic before, but this is what I'm trying to tell you, that you can give good results to these patients and give them an option of going in for even a refractive lens exchange because having a plus 12 diopter glasses is not easy. You know the aberrations. So just to summarize, this is my last slide. Uh, think of customization of IOL power, what Dr. Ambika said. Monovision gives you excellent outcomes in high myopes, hyperopes also. Counsel, counsel, counsel your patients. Talk to them. Tell them that there is a margin of error even in the best surgical hands, and also that you need to be prepared to wear glasses. Check refraction, do one eye, plan the other eye, and always under-promise and over-deliver. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Dr. Savio. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh,
So, Dr. Ambika, um, uh, please, uh, if you could please uh, uh, let, us, let us felicitate Dr. Savio by giving him the. Yeah, if we do have some more time, so we can take questions here. Yeah. So it was an excellent um, our discussion actually of various aspects and say our talk was excellent actually yeah yeah and um, one point I always highlight is a uh, monovision uh, have one eye adjusted for not totally near but intermediate distance I generally put minus 0.75 or minus 1 maximum minus 1.25 unless it is a surprise of minus 2 otherwise it's always um, the refraction I always keep one eye Mm, on that slightly myopic side and that really works for most of the patients except for patients probably who are driving and all who wants to be with our glasses by, uh, while driving and people who are voracious readers and all for mobile uh, uh, or uh, laptop or uh, iPad and all you can still have a mini monovision is good enough to uh, do most of the activi activities and that is one thing and um, your videos were very good and become and I feel when, whenever during surgery you have an iris collapse to the main node, stop, you can put one more hook, get one more hook, sub-incisionally from the sclera, go in and hook that prolapsed iris back and keep it there so that it will not come again and again so that you are also worried, the iris gets more traumatized. So that is one tip I want to give. That is one thing I practice whenever I get a similar uh, situation in my hands or in my trainee's hands. We always put in one more hook at that point. Uh, and uh, uh, when a trainee starts PECO and you go b across and catch the iris multiple times and starts damaging, so once the iris has been caught, then it will have a tendency to come again and again to the PECO tip. And particularly a trainee will always keep it slightly above. They are worried actually whether they'll go and hit the PC. So that catching the iris across is always happening. You know, in your initial cases. So you can put in a simple hook there and keep that iris away. You don't have to put multiple hooks. The pupil is not constricted. But that area, that iris has a tendency. Whenever the iris has a tendency to come into your phago tip, if you put a hook and just keep it there, don't have to really stretch also because already pupil is mid-directed or more so that they can also continue doing. This is one other thing I want to say. And uh, yeah, that's all. Anything you want to add? Sir, I have a doubt. In my short career, one thing that has troubled me is like the negative dysphotopsia. Patients say, they can see everything looking straight, but the shadow is bothering them. So any tips on that, sir? Yeah. This is one problem that has been there right from the time we started doing fake and uh, using all these, uh, particularly the square edge lenses and all. So when the patient comes after one week or two weeks for the third, second or third visit and say, I am seeing a black shadow, the first thing you should say is, do is you should say with confidence that that will be there, your brain will adapt to it, it will take six months. That's all. In six months, 90% of them will go away. The patient will slowly, see, when you buy a heart batter shoe, first 15 days it will bite. Then after that, your uh, uh, feet will get used to it. Brain has a very good ability to adapt, actually. So don't go in and manipulate and create unnecessary problems again and again. We have dis described procedures for negative dysphotopsia. You can go in, uh, do a minimal hydro dissection, get, up the, uh, put up, get the optic out and get a reverse optic capture. That is supposed to uh, be useful. Second is we have now have rings, actually. But there was on Delhi uh, a doctor who has come out with a ring 
uh, I think uh, photopsia, negative photopsia ring, which can be kept in the sulcus, which can also help. But by and large, I feel, don't put it into the air head that something serious is happening. Patients will slowly forget that. They have got so many other issues to handle. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what Sir said is absolutely right. And one of the things which I do is I make the patient sit down. I put the trial frame. The trial frame has a very narrow aperture. And the moment you put the trial frame, it goes off. And you tell them, see, your vision is absolutely fine. Make the patient relative. To the, now you can see it. No, I can't see it. Don't worry. That is the incision I made to put the lens inside. It happens to all the patients, and it goes off on its own in three months. Nothing to worry. This is normal. So reassurance is the key. Um, all those uh, devices, as Sir rightly said, they are there. Do you want to actually go and meddle? I would not. You know? But always remember to dilate and have, do a proper indentation indirect before you decide that this is definitely a native. Thank you so much. I usually tell patients that, you know, your cataract was blocking all the light earlier. Now a lot of light is coming in. Now your brain is, imagine you go into a very bright light from a dark room, suddenly you feel, you know, a lot of light. So something your brain is now telling you there's too much light going in. That is why it's creating a shadow. It will go away. This is the usual technique okay, I use. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, I just yeah, wanted to... You have to uh, get that patient. Because I'm not going to tell them that my incision created it. <laughs> you know, because, you know... <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Ambiya actually described uh, that case, you know, with 60 millimeters of mercury intraocular pressure. And uh, you had a lens thickness of four point something. Yes, yes. And the other eye's lens thickness was? Uh, yeah, that seems awfully low, I mean, for a lens thickness. I was just saying that uh, even if you, I mean, that eye is probably going to only respond to a cataract extraction, but it might make sense to do an iridotomy before you do it. Because irrespective of the cause, generally iridotomy will deepen the chamber. It will make your subsequent cataract surgery a little more easier. In not in all cases. I think literature tells you around about 75% of eyes, the width of the angle increases uh, after iridotomy. And as long as it's not like in an iris which is extremely thick and you are going to do a lot of inflammation doing it, generally, though you are planning a lens extraction, and a, a prior iridotomy usually helps uh, even in your, when you're doing the uh, cataract surgery. And generally, I think the Ronnie is here. No, he's not here. Oh, uh, there is uh, this uh, look at ocular biometrics in, in glaucoma. There are a lot of publications. Generally, lens thickness do not correlate well uh, with, you know, uh, as we might think, okay, you have thick lenses and that might correlate. Because there are a lot of other things. Uh, the actual length of the patient may be different. The thing that might correlate better might be the lens volt. You know, the vertical distance from the anterior portion and the horizontal line between the scleral spur. Uh, as we were describing in, uh, in Dr. Ronnie was describing, yeah, in the morning, uh, the lens volt is generally probably more important than the lens thickness. In fact, current studies that tells you that lens thickness has no meaning with respect to angle closure. It's very likely that in that particular patient, you, the lens volt must have been very, very high. Uh, and in, anyway, the lens volt measurement may not be possible in all institutions. Uh, for people who have it, it's, it's very, it's an interesting thing to have. Again, as we were mentioning in the morning, there is no uh, cutoff uh, value for uh, lens volt that actually tells you, okay, this is a higher lens volt, this is a lower lens volt. But by and large, um, uh, on an average, I think 800 microns is pretty much the, and if you have a lens volt of greater than one, at least you know that before you go ahead with the uh, cataract or the lens extraction that, okay, you are going to do some benefit to the patient. But generally in those eyes, uh, when you do a gonioscope, you'll see a lot of iris bowing. The problem is every uh, angle closure suspect, so any shallow AC, if you do gonioscopy, all of them will be classified as PAC, yes? But their iris will look completely different. Sometimes the bowing will be so much. So it's, it's, it's not like, you know, all PACs are the same. So maybe an indirect way of assessing that would be to see the bowing of the iris because in lens, lens folds, the bowing will be very, very high. Uh, if there is a possibility of measuring the lens fold, that might be a good idea.
No, we have data. What it, what is, what the problem with problem with that is, it's not showing a huge difference between angle closures and open angles and intraocular pressures and correlation. Yeah, possible. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe an iridotomy anyway would have probably helped you to some extent. Actually, I tried an iridotomy in that patient, work. but it didn't work. Okay. Is, there, there was iridocorneal touch. The IOP came down, but still we couldn't break the attack. Yeah. And uh, I mean, cat, like cataract extraction, <laughs> as somebody mentioned, it's not for the faint-hearted in such uh, eyes, you know? Yeah, that I agree. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, I always have a, I would say a healthy agree to disagree effect with my glaucoma specialist because uh, I never like PIs, meaning nothing against anything about PIs because what I've seen with PIs, it gets more reaction in the anterior chamber, pupils don't dilate well post PIs, sometimes the zonules get affected. Uh, this is just uh, my personal thing and nothing against PIs, uh, meaning they do work well. So I would rather prefer doing a surgical PI. And if I'm entering the eye for cataract, and if I want to break an attack, I'm anyway there inside. I can do a control surgical PI if I need it at that time. And that way, I can clear up things much more easier. And most of the time, the anterior chamber deepens so beautifully after your cataract. Your Eagle study, which recently said the same thing. So uh, yes, doing a PI, especially when the cornea is edematous, the iris is boggy, you will end up releasing more pigments, and that is like having to operate now on a uveitic eye, which is high pressures, which the pupil doesn't dilate. So that was the only thing. But yes, when we see a patient, just counseling, come on, we take you up for surgery, they may not be very acceptable and receptible to that. Then the PI is something which you can put as a transition between that. A gateway before that. It's like, you know, like now everybody's talking about MIGS nowadays. They say MIGS before trap. But yeah, at the end of the day, you, you know, you all know that. So it's, yes, it, it's not very acceptable to them. Yes. You're yes, yes. So it's much more cleaner. You can wash off it and you can see it on table, the cornea clearing up and all. This is just, yes, yes. Option of that. True, but true. Uh, Dr. Ganesh, how many acute angle closure attacks were you not able to break with a PI if it was present? Okay. Yes. Uh, that is out of how many acute closures? There will be five times that much who have got away with PI. The thing is the acute closure, the primary thing is to bring the pressure down. Yes, and yes. that is primarily not by the PI, that's by mannitol and systemic medication true, and things true. like that. And once you get those three days down the line and you do a PI, it's a decent normal PI. True, true. I would disagree with uh, going into an angry acute closure attack with uh, any surgical option. Yeah, yeah. It's always, yeah, mannitol first, glycerol, you give yeah. your you, things. You have time. You yes. wait for those two days. Those two days of 50 pressures don't matter. True. After that, it's, you want to do a PI, you want to do a cataract surgery straight off. Yeah. If you're doing a cataract surgery, I do not think a, a surgical PI is needed. Yes. yes. It's absolutely not needed. You got it's rid of the same. And Eagle study, there are enough issues. Yeah. Please don't tell glaucoma specialists yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> about Eagle study. It's yeah. a study that gives you one more reason to do cataract surgery. So yeah, it's a cataract yeah. surgeon study, it's not a glaucoma person study. Yeah, it's like this, you know, the indication for doing cataract surgery is lens in the eye. It's like the indication for putting intravital injection is retina in the eye. So it's on a lighter note, but what I'm going to say is, you're treating the cause by doing a cataract surgery in acute angle closure because the patient will never develop an acute attack again once you remove that lens out. That is bang on. Yes, with a PI, the PI can get closed and can develop an acute attack anytime later on. But once that is done, the patient will never develop that. I'm, I'm talking from a cataract perspective. Uh, I know glaucoma people will have to agree, second that. But uh, yeah, that, that's how Octal is. Yeah. Right. We have to come conclude the session. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So thank you all for uh, attending our IC.